thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you so much to the witnesses for being here today. It's really a pretty exciting time for the U.S. space program. I know that uh, my colleagues and, all, and I all watched uh, this Ryan test launch with great interest. And I want to also join my colleagues who congratulate NASA, Lockheed Martin, United Launch Alliance, and everyone who participated in this uh, test flight. I heard from some of my constituents who really applauded this, uh, saw this as a big step uh, in our leadership in space. Uh, and it, that comes as welcome news as we're trying to inspire our and uh, spark interest in the next generation of uh, young scientists. Uh, in our previous space subcommittee hearings, we've talked about the challenge of communicating the importance of NASA's work and mission to our constituency who support the mission with their hard-earned tax dollars. And as Mr. Bridenstine was saying, uh, we have a lot of people who are inspired, uh, looking back to the Apollo missions and the moon landing. Uh, but that public outreach is really important, and I, I noticed that you gave us a publication here that has, it takes a country that talks about all the places across the country uh, where the, uh, the parts and pieces were supplied and, and purchased, and that shows a, a broad uh, range of states um, and, and businesses, I'm sure, that participated in that. That kind of thing is important to convince our constituents uh, of the importance uh, economically as well. Uh, I want to make sure Mr. Bridenstine saw the congressman on board picture in this publication, too, because you, you have some of our congressmen pictured in there. Uh, also, um, I know that the, the budget challenges and the, this, the lack of certainty is, is very, very important. And Mr. Gertzdemeyer, you talked about that need for stability. Um, and, and it's certainly something that we talk about here on a regular basis, uh, that that certainty in decision making is, and long term thinking is so important, especially uh, more so for NASA than perhaps many of the other uh, decisions that we make here. And also we know uh, about the importance of, uh, of safety, uh, acknowledging, uh, as we all know, that space exploration involves risk. There are safety concerns, uh, and, I, and I know that NASA does a lot to address those. So Mr. Gertzdemeyer, some have said that outfitting the Orion with the necessary, necessary life support equipment on the first crewed mission will cause the spacecraft to be overweight. So should we be concerned about that? What options does NASA have to mitigate this possibility? Again, we, if the, uh, the flight test we just flew, the next flight of Orion will be uh, significantly lighter. We've done a major redesign of some of the structures to actually lower the weight uh, of Orion. And that wasn't easy to make those changes, but they've done that. We've also are starting, as I described earlier, testing some of the life support systems on board space stations, so we'll know how much they will actually weigh and some of those systems are in place. So I think we have a sound approach to, uh, to address the concerns that you raised. We'll, we know what it will take to add the life support system and we'll make sure that it can be added and still not exceed the, the mission weight. Thank you. And then also, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, I want to follow up on your response to Ms. Edwards' question. You know, we, we tend to focus on the SLS and Orion when we think of the exploration program, but I want to talk a little bit more about the ground infrastructure at the Space Center, uh, which is also undergoing some significant development to support the SLS and Orion launches. I know there's been work on the mobile launcher, the tower, the vehicle assembly build, building, the launch pad 39B underway. So where does that ground infrastructure work stand uh, relative to the progress being made on SLS and Orion? Are they in sync so that they'll be ready at the same time? Yeah, again, I think you saw in the video a lot of activity that's going on down in Florida. Um, that work is in, in progress. Uh, when we completed the KDPC review for ground systems and it shows a 70 percent confidence level for that equipment to be ready in Florida to support a launch in, I think, June of 2018. So it's, it's on schedule to move forward. It has challenges. It needs to be worked as well. And again, I would stress I don't see that all these activities have to line up. Even if SLS is ready a little bit early and the ground system isn't fully there, it's still the right thing to do to move the rocket down to Florida and begin checking out umbilical interfaces to see how it's going to fit with the launch tower, to see how it will fit with the launch pad. That still fits from an overall schedule standpoint. So there's not a 
there's not a disconnect in the schedule. Even though they don't, everything doesn't arrive at precisely the same time, it's perfectly appropriate to have one component arrive before. Thank you. And, and I, I'm going to squeeze one more question in here. As demonstrated by the House passed uh, NASA authorization of 2014, there's a strong sentiment for NASA to have a policy on termination liability that really maximizes the, the use of appropriated funds to make progress in meeting those established technical goals and schedule milestones. Uh, so is, how is NASA currently handling potential termination liability for SLS and Orion? Yeah, it's, it's actually not a NASA policy. We believe it's part of the Anti-Defamation Act where the, the termination liability is required by all agencies to be handled in a similar manner to which the agency does. So uh, you know, we, that's, that's where we are. So it's not unique to NASA and, and unique to what we've done in the past. Thank you very much. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.